The power of Premiere is truly mind-blowing for a filmmaker. I was blown away by how intuitive the entire program was and how you could keep everything contained into one place. With Premiere, I was able to basically do an entire feature film. Your job as an editor is to make dialogue drama. I'm doing all of that in Premiere Pro, and I'm doing it easier than I do it with other systems. For me, editing is 50% of direction because I'm, I'm recreating it in post and I'm rewriting it in post. On this film, I did not have a budget for an assistant editor, so I was doing all the assistant editing on the go. But Adobe's syncing was a lifesaver. It's much harder in the other platforms that I've used before. I can take the rushes straight into Premiere on my laptop, no transcoding or anything like that, and just start editing. The things that you're able to do with this family of software is remarkable. Mindhunter was cut on Adobe Premiere, and we are big fans of Dynamic Link, which uses After Effects as well. It is helpful for all of us to be using Adobe products because we're kind of speaking the same language. Hi. Hi. Hey. Like, the way my brain operates, it's like, I want to do some music, I want to do some visual, I want to do some Photoshop, I want to do some After Effects all together in one hour, <laughs> you know? So it's nice to have them all open. From my very first exposure to the field of creative arts, Adobe was there from the beginning. Anything that allows me to be creative without thinking about the software or hardware, makes me a better, more efficient filmmaker and allows me to focus on the task at hand, which is storytelling. The editing system doesn't get in your way and allows you to facilitate the vision that you think in your head that you would like to be able to do, and the system says, yeah, I can do that. I made this movie. It's awesome. <laughs> and I did it with Adobe products. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Art of the Edit Insights from the Front Lines. Uh, my name is Megan Keene. I am part of the professional film team at Adobe. Um, and I'm so excited to be here. We have three amazingly talented editors from feature film to television who are here to share some of their stories from inside the cutting room. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce you to our three panelists. Uh, Lisa Zeno Churgan began her career editing, working as an assistant on the cult classic, The Warriors, followed by Raging Bull. She finished her assisting career working on The Accidental Tourist with her mentor, Carol Littleton. Favorite credits include Bob Roberts, Reality Bites, Dead Man Walking, Gattaca, Cider House Rules, The Wedding Planner, House of Sand and Fog, The Ugly Truth, Pitch Perfect, Pete's Dragon, and her most recent, The Old Man and the Gun. Um, so we also have Kyle Ryder, who is a, a self-taught picture editor whose credits include Comedy Central's Another Period, FX, FX's Man Seeking Woman, and Atlanta, including the Emmy Award-winning episode B.A.N., and his H HBO's forthcoming Barry. His love of storytelling is matched only by his love of ice cream. He lives in Los Angeles with his wife and two-year-old son and Puggle. Are we I, I forgot I put the ice cream <laughs> thing in there. Sorry. I mean, sorry, I, sorry. I, I was my bad. Cream too, so it's okay. Um, are we going to go with a trailer or should we go ahead on to Sofia? Okay. Sofia Subercaso is a Chilean editor based out of New York City. She began her career on Sebastian Silva's Crystal Fairy. She continued co collaborating with Silva on Nasty Baby, which played at Sundance in 2015, and his short films Dolphin and Dance, Dance, Dance. She also edited Antonio Campos's Christine, which was at Sundance in 2016, the documentary's Dina, which won Grand Jury Prize for Documentary here at the festival last year, and Mala Mala. In 2017, she was named one of the 25 new faces of film by Filmmaker Magazine. This year, she comes back to Sundance with her new collaboration with Silva Tyrell and Nicholas Pesch's Piercing, which is in the midnight category. So please welcome all three of our amazing panelists. So Lisa, from your bio, you clearly have a very long and impressive career. Um, dating back as far as one of my very favorites, Reality Bites, not to mention Gattaca, Cider House Rules, and you were an assistant on Raging Bull. <laughs> um, 
Now, I, I would love to start off by hearing a little bit about the trajectory of your career. I mean, you started your career cutting on film and most recently have moved to Premiere Pro. So how is how is that transition through your career been and how has technology sort of played a role in your career? So first of all, how many people in this room have cut on film? Oh, looks like okay. maybe seven, mm -hmm. eight. <laughs> um, I miss splicing sometimes. I miss uh, the um, getting up and having to get a roll and threading. I don't miss threading up the cam. I definitely don't do that. Um, I obviously when I started, uh, that's all we worked on. I actually worked on a flatbed, uh, a cam, which was sort of unusual because everybody worked on a moviola at that time. And then in um, when I did Gattaca, that was when I was able to make the transition to digital. And I went to high school with the person, Bill Warner, who invented the Avid. That's my claim to fame. And um, so I actually, at that point, Lightworks was one of the other digital editing systems that was really popular, but I wanted to learn the Avid because everybody said it was the harder machine to learn and I wanted to learn the harder one first. I just thought that that would be a better way to do it. And um, then I had the opportunity, I took over a Lightworks show, I learned Lightworks. I had to take over Final Cut show and I learned Final Cut and then on this most recent project when we did Pete's Dragon, David Lowry who's been editing since he was two um, and working on Final Cut wanted to do Pete's Dragon on Premiere and I said you know this is the first time we're going to be working together it would really be much better for me if we did it on Avid but if we work together again I'll learn Premiere and so I did. So here we are. Yes, <laughs> but thanks to very, Adobe was very kind and did help provide a teacher because you did need to teach me new tricks. <laughs> and Kyle, I know that you are self-taught. Um, you did not go to film school. What was your, what, did you start off as a, an assistant? How did, how did you get, get, get to where you are today? I, well, I started making my own stuff and was, just started cutting friends things, my own, my own things. I did assist for a while. That was just sort of a day job. It was a, I was trying to get union hours really and, and, and pay rent, but I really learned how to do it, just making things really. And Sophia, your story is quite similar though. You did go to film school. You edited a lot of your own projects, friends projects. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I went to film school, but I didn't edit much in film school. I edited a few um, short films that I directed. And then I went into producing, and I started producing Sebastian film, uh, Silva's uh, Crystal Ferry. And when we wrapped the movie, which was in English, but shot in Chile, we needed an editor that speak, spoke English, and we didn't have one. And Sebastian asked me if I knew how to cut, and I kind of like lied and say I <laughs> said I did. And I started cutting it kind of like just to get the process going and thinking that someone else was going to come in and take over. And it started working out. So um, I became an editor, but it was completely like, f f I considered myself like a fake editor for like <laughs> like three movies. And then I was like, okay, maybe I'm a real editor now. And Kyle, both you and Sophia came up in the digital age, never cut film. How important has it been to both of you to be nimble, flexible in terms of learning new technology? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I feel like we're in a weird window where everything is, is evolving so quickly that, you know, I've, I, I learned on Final Cut and then learned Avid and now work on Premiere. And I mean, I can't even imagine what it must have, you know, I've never cut film. So for me, it feels really fast and I'm constantly having to learn new things. And I haven't, you know, been doing it very long. So I can, I can only imagine what. <laughs> in terms of the fast thing, it's still, even if you have, and this is one of the things that happened when the transition was being made, producers were so excited, oh my God, we're gonna have so many different versions. There are still only a certain number of good versions. You can, I worked with somebody once and he made 20 versions and 
15 of them were crap. You know, I mean, it's like you still have to go through the thought process and it is still a process. You still have to think. It doesn't mean you can just slap something together. I mean, you can sometimes, but it doesn't necessarily make sense. So all the dots don't go together. So in terms of having cut f movies on film and having cut them electronically, to me, there's actually not that much difference. It's still the process of storytelling. You have to sit with it. You have to make mistakes. You have to experiment. You have to do, it was just, you didn't, and actually sometimes when you worked on film, you thought about it a little bit more because you ended up with way too many splices and then you'd have to order a reprint or you'd tear your film or things like that. So sometimes the thought process was actually a little bit more um, diligent and, um, but pictures always speak louder than words. So trying things is always good, but it still doesn't mean you have a gazillion options. You, you bring up a good point, actually, about the time and, and working in the digital age. Um, I know, Sophia, that you often, because you work so much in independent film, will start a project with an assistant editor, but then sort of have to go it alone for the trajectory of the film. How, I mean, are you given the time and space to sort of take your time and review? Or do you, how, how do you go about approaching a film when you're, going it alone with no assistant? I'm kind of used to it because it's all I know, I guess. So, um, I don't know. I just did one movie with an, uh, for, with an assistant for the entire process and it was like a refreshing um, thing that I had like someone that could help me along the way with things that I was used to doing on my own. But, but I think it's just... I mean, even if they're small movies, you still get the chat. Like, like I've cut all these like indie movies in weird circumstances, but but I, we still cut the movie that we want to cut, and we take the time that we need to take, and whatever that whatever that 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 may be, you know. And do you approach it differently when you know you're going into a, a project where you will have an assistant versus when you won't? Not really. No, I think it, that's just more like like it's the support of having someone working with you and helping you with all the annoying technical stuff that I'm really bad at and just, and also like, what it does help is like when I have an assistant, I can tell her, for example, do stacks for all these scenes and that makes my process reviewing footage way more, like way easier and faster. And if I'm working on my own, I don't necessarily have the time to do, by stacks I mean when you like put, for example, each like, a uh, line of dialogue if there's six takes you put one next to the other like immediately next to the other so you can like play and see like the six version of it and pick the best one stuff like that that if i'm working on my own i don't have the time to do or i don't have the patience to do so much really. and kyle i know on atlanta i mean really across the industry post uh, assistants, uh, assistant editors are invaluable in terms of keeping things going. Um, why are your assistants so important to the work that you guys do? Well, f first of all, the guys that we work with are incredible on the technical side, which I too have, I don't, I'm terrible at it. But we do, uh, on Atlanta, we do a lot of our own VFX in house. And so, in addition to doing the regular AE stuff, these guys are really, really good about doing the After Effects and Photoshop and things like that. So we have pretty complete versions of the show, you know, in our offline, and that's due in large part to our to our assistants. They're also super technically savvy guys it's having crazy. Met them. Yeah, no, they're the stuff that they know is just I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> And Lisa, I know that this is your first time working with assistant editor Mike Melendi. Uh, how, what do you look for when you're when you're hiring an assistant editor? Um, somebody who is articulate. I often say good lunch company because I generally always eat lunch with my assistant, and that's a lot of lunches. Um, I want somebody who can look at the film and analyze and. Um, share the whole process with me. Uh, I like to talk about it. 
other than just with the director and my poor husband who has to hear me talk about it all the time at home. And, you know, after I kept showing him multiple versions of the film at one point, he said, could you just show it to me like at the end? <laughs> because I can't tell the difference. But so the thing is, is that your assistant is there with you all the way and um, you get to complain and they don't tell anybody. Um, I get to, I am not a technical person, so uh, for Mike, especially on this movie, and the very first time I worked on Avid, and the same thing Lightworks and Final Cut, um, my assistant is essential because I want to be able to just cut, and then I mess it up invariably, and they're there to fix it. And uh, But the thing that's really important to me is to be able to have somebody to talk to about the whole thing and obviously keep everything together. I've actually been really lucky. I've never worked without an assistant. But I've come up through the very classical way of I was an assistant editor and then I became an editor. And, but that process took a long time. And uh, on in the same vein of, of the relationships in the cutting room, uh, while this is the um, the old man and the gun is your first film cutting on Premiere Pro, it's actually your second film working with David Lowry, the first being Pete's Dragon. What was your, what is your working relationship like with David? Um, well, David is an editor himself, so uh, sometimes he'll go and take something that he is sort of worried about or really needs to think about and he'll play with it himself. Um, generally, he comes in, I assemble the film. Uh, I don't actually like using the word assemble because it's much more involved than an assembly. It's a real, I call it a first cut. Um, and uh, he watches it uh, pretty soon after shooting. And then if we have the luxury on this movie, we had the luxury of starting from the beginning on Pete's Dragon, we had to start with visual effects scenes, but we just sort of sit in the room together and then when he gets really bored and crazy, he goes out. He often will give me notes, which is my uh, preference. I like to go through it and take notes because I find that when I'm by myself, I experiment a lot more because I don't feel like I'm uh, taking up too much of the director's time. I wanna be able to make really stupid mistakes and not have somebody sitting back there going, oh no, that wasn't what, you know, you're in the middle, you're in the middle of 12 steps. And, you know, some directors will go, that wasn't what I wanted, well, but I'm not there yet, so let's. So, and I think it's best for David too, because he just, um, it's hard for him to sit there. Uh, we edit by um, Frame.io. Uh, we've edited, uh, he was in New Zealand and I was in LA. We've edited with FaceTime. Um, with Tim Robbins, I edited on the telephone. <laughs> you know, it's just, I held up things with the telephone. So it's like, whatever works. And Sophia, um, you, Sebastian, uh, uh, Silva and yourself have worked together on numerous projects outside of both being Chilean, uh, <laughs> what is it about your working relationship that really makes things click for you? Um, well, we're, we're really close friends other than work, than being like collaborators. And I think we've kind of like stepped into some sort of pace and system that makes sense. So now we've been cutting on his like, Sebastian also paints, so we cut in his painting studio, which is like this huge space in Dumbo. And he's painting and I'm cutting and I call him over and he's like, what do you think of this? And he thinks and he keeps on painting. So like it's... So bohemian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not, yeah. And then, and, it, and, and also, um, Sebastian is really impatient, so he could never sit through an edit. Uh, and I don't like having someone breathing down my neck because what you said is like, it's like, I know it's not, Yet dead, there yet I'm trying to do something and and you get you start getting really self-conscious if you, if you're trying to experiment with things that you know are not the final thing but it's a way of getting to where you want to go and it's hard to do that with someone like watching everything that you're doing it's kind of like also it's not productive I don't know there's no really well especially I know on uh, the film that you have here at the festival Tyrell much of the film was improvisation and that there wasn't necessarily 
a set script for the whole film. Um, so there must have been a lot of experimentation in the edit that you had to do. Can you talk about your process on Tyrell? Yeah, Tyrell was a very uh, difficult one, but in a good way. It's The good thing is that Sebastian improvise a lot in terms of like dialogue and where the people are going to be but like he has a very clear vision of what of what each scene is about or what needs to happen or what this scene needs to trigger in order for to go to the next scene so so like we always know what the scene is about it's just about like technically getting there and getting the right pace it feels like with this movie we're talking about the analogy that like editing is pretty much like making a puzzle like a um how do you call that puzzles? Jigsaw puzzles, whatever? Yeah. And you start with the edges and then you go in and you regroup like through colors and whatever. This felt like it was a, m a puzzle without edges. You know what I mean? Like you needed to like start from the inside out. And that's challenging and exhausting at times, but also really fun because you need to start getting creative in order to make it work because it's not shot in a conventional way and you have 10 people in a room improvising and like moving around and you're just, yeah. You need to like get, and Kyle, you are now onto your second season uh, at, at 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 Atlanta. Um, and while you're obviously working for the most part with a single director, some guest directors, you also, uh, I'm sure, have to take into consideration uh, Donald Glover's input, the star and producer of the uh, show, while also working with a co-editor, while also having to keep sort of a cohesive voice and storyline throughout the episodes. How do you balance all of the, the different creative inputs and keep that cohesion? Well, on Atlanta, I'm lucky because uh, myself, Hero, Mariah, our director, who sort of acts as Donald's surrogate when he's not around, and uh, Donald and our other editor, Isaac, we all are, especially at this point in the show, we know what it is, we know how it works, and we're pretty laser focused on where we're going with it so it doesn't it, it never feels like different parts coming together we I, I feel like the, the four of us are all once it's shot once we're in post it feels like kind of one brain working as one thing and i know i, I know that i've worked in tv shows where it's not like that at all but on this one we're lucky that it, that it is um conversely lisa you have had a a resume of films where it's like i mean i think the the standout is from reality bites to gattaca <laughs> the the different tone and emotional balance of the projects that you work on are just so diverse. How do you balance that when you're going from one project to the next and, and experiencing a total shift in the style of film? Um, I've always sort of thought that the film and the story and the style in which it's shot dictates mostly how you're going to approach it. It's not like I'm going to, because if you push too much against the grain, you can feel it. If somebody tries to manipulate films that have been over edited, you can, there's something wrong. You don't quite know what it is, but you can sense that it, that's what it is. And um, there was a period of time when I did movies where somebody died in every single movie. And then at a certain point, I, I think that's why I did The Wedding Planner. I was just like, I have to have people stop dying. I think you know it's like I really had in in House of Sanded Fog, the cop shot the kid, the husband then poisoned his wife and he suffocated himself with a plastic bag. And this all happened in the last reel. So it was just like when let's not talk about dead man walking. Um, so the thing is is that at a certain point you get really emotionally involved in these films. And so there are times when I've been working on something like Dead Man Walking or House of Santa Fog, and I really want to work on a comedy. And I've been lucky. I've been able to do those different kinds of things, and it really helps. And as far as your edit, do you feel like you have to shift consciousness or the way that you're approaching the edit, or is it sort of telling a story is telling a story, and the emotional beats may change a little bit, but the process is still similar? Um, we had this wonderful conversation as a as preparation for this, and we were talking about as editors, our job is to find the truth in a scene, and you do that in comedy. I personally like comedy that's based in character and not situation. I don't generally work on. Uh, I'm not a. I would not be suited to work on a dumb comedy. I love them sometimes, but I I'm not the person for that because I 
trail the emotional content of something, whether or not it's somebody walking to death row or whether or not it's somebody being ignored in a comedic way or um, something like that. And that is, to me, what I always look for in a scene. And um, so I think that it just, as long as you get the truth of the comedy, the truth of the drama, the truth of the action, that's, that's what we're always looking for. I think. And Sophia, similarly, I mean, I just look across your three most recent films, Dina to Tyrell to Piercing, they're all so, so different. Um, do you have any tricks when you're sort of switching between projects that are so diverse? Um, I don't know if it's so much to switching from one to another, I think, like what you were saying with like editing movies about people dying all the time, you get to like a point, especially towards the end for me, where I'm just like dreaming about it and I'm repeating the things in my head and I like someone says something, I was like, oh, that's a line on the movie. And I'm like, and in Dine it was insane because it was like 300 hours of footage of people watching TV and like riding the bus and I was starting to go crazy. But um, But I think, yeah, a good vacation in between and just try to like I don't know <laughs> yeah there's nothing to do but like other than that I, like, it's just it's nice that like if it w if a movie lasted for five years I don't know what I would do that would be hell you know like <laughs> it's good that you get to like and it's exciting too like I get to change jobs every like three times a year it's it's fun now with every film and with every show, there are these magic scenes that you know, I'm sure going into it, you're like, I have to nail this scene in order for this whole thing to work. When you go into the edit, do you know, like can you tell from the beginning, like these are scenes that I really need to make sure that I nail? And if so, how, how do you approach them or do you approach them differently? Um, I think, you know, and you know from the script, in my case, I think, because you know, not with documentaries, of course, but you know which ones are the scenes that are gonna be like more complicated or more meaningful. I remember in Christine, we had the suicide scene that was like, because it's a movie about a woman that kill her, kills herself on her. And there were so many factors to that scene and there was, it was shot in so from, because it was her on stage and people back on the switch and people loading the thing in the back room. So it was like all these parallel storylines happening at the same time. And there were so many ways of doing it and it was so delicate and it the most powerful and meaningful scene of the mo whole movie that I feel like also at the end of the day, you I feel more comfortable about that scene than most of the other scenes in that movie because we really tried everything and we thought about every single like frame on that scene. So it's it's, they're like the special scenes, but they are like, they take more time too. So I feel like if you do it right, then it pays off. I agree with her. You, you know beforehand a lot of times, and especially once the dailies come in. And um, I find the hardest thing is how to start. It's always like, what is the first cut gonna be? Am I gonna start? Am I gonna start wide? Am I gonna say, you know, it's like, and once I get, um, once <laughs> I can actually figure out how to get into the scene, then it's, I'm personally somebody who does it cut to cut. I don't do, I know editors who have structured the whole thing in their brain. Um, I know an editor who used to just pull things from his dailies roles and have his assistants assemble it and it was like a cut because he was so structured in the way that he did it. But I personally have to feel it. And with Sophia, it's the same thing. W the hardest scenes are the ones that you you spend the most time working on and you just have a sense of ownership in terms of you care more, uh, well you care about each and every scene, but there are certain things that really, really have to resonate and so you put extra time in it and you wanna always feel like you have explored every option. Kyle? <laughs> I just I just panic when I get to that stuff. I just like think about how inexpensive a house in the Midwest would be. <laughs> like would I be happy working at a bank? 
<laughs> no, but I think you know. No, I, I, I yeah, I think you, you, you spend more time on it. You really. I was just this week. I was cutting a scene on the season of Atlanta, and it's really, in a way, sort of a culmination of the entire season. And it's two people on a couch talking. And I knew, you know, obviously it's it's probably the most important scene of the, at least of that episode. And so it's really just sort of focusing in on what makes it important and, and why there's a focus on it and trying to lean into that and pull it as close to the surface as you can while, while still being, you know, intriguing and, and not be too on the nose about it. But, yeah, I don't – I don't uh – I, I try to trick myself into thinking everything is e of equal importance. I guess that's the answer. I know that's not true, but in my brain, that's how I deal with it. I have a question for you. Did the scene reveal itself to you? Definitely. Because that's yeah. the thing that starts to happen, especially right. in these tough things. Um, and dialogue scenes, which are my favorite, because that's just sort of, I love watching people talk to each other and I love watching people's reactions. And in drama, you get to focus more on the reaction of what the effect that somebody is saying has upon someone um, versus comedy, which you pretty much go to the end of the line and then you cut to a reaction shot or something like that. So it's just in those kinds of scenes, once you started going yeah. and allowed everybody and especially because in the show obviously everybody knows where they're supposed to be and what right and it's we as editors sort of have to get out of the way right. oddly right. enough there's a strange way so that you can get to that simplicity you can get to that truth especially if it's a scene that sounds as important as it no was. and you know what you're exactly right because what sort of clicked for the for me in that scene is when i watched one of the actors just his reaction to the other actor and started it would, i figured out like oh this is what I need to lean on is this and not the actual, you know, and once, once that sort of became clear in the scene, then it was actually pretty easy. Now what, I mean, there's that classic line, fix it in post, right? So what about those scenes that just aren't working, whether it's that, you know, the performance wasn't there or the coverage isn't there or what, for whatever reason, it's just not working. How do you approach those magical scenes? <laughs> Well, it's you try everything under the sun. Um, you um, you become a very good dialogue editor, and you take <coughs> dialogue from another scene and things from David Lowry in the movie that we just did. Robert Redford was in the same suit the entire movie. So we were able to move things around, restructure. Oh it was the smartest thing in the world. It was so fantastic. We never had to worry about, oh my God, what they're wearing. And we did this scene in The Ugly Truth where they, her skirt had been, Katherine Heigl's skirt had been ripped off. It got caught in a car, and it, it just ended up being really stupid. That's one of those situational things, and it really wasn't that funny. So <laughs> visual effects. We created a skirt. She didn't lose her skirt. So, I mean, in the world of visual effects, you actually can really fix it in post a lot of times. No, I, I when yeah, that's that's a great answer. That's crazy that they put a skirt back on her. Um, yeah, no, that's that really the stuff that we do is is really. Um, I don't know. If something's just not working unless it's absolutely essential. I I, I am I, I probably lean too far towards we don't need this. We don't need this. Cut this out. Because I, I I I think I that's always my first instinct, and then it's always I need to step back and go. No, we. And it's always best to try it without. I'm of course, a big right? Thing. Yeah. You're doing, it's like, let's try it without it. And if you miss it, then you have to put it in and then you have to figure out another way to use it. But I agree with right, you 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like a lot of times if it's really not working, there's a reason why it's not working right. and it shouldn't be there. How about you, Sophia? I agree with both things. I think um, you really just like get creative and start Frankensteining performances and and just... I think in that case, I tend to like prioritize, like if the, I rather jump the like ed, like the line and have a good performance that care too much about continuity or like point of view, like, you know, I think in those cases I tend to forget about technical stuff and prioritize uh, performance, but yeah, you just need to get really creative and go find other lines in another scenes or like just try different, yeah, whatever, whatever it takes. And then, Another similarity between all of the projects that you've worked on is that there are these 
very either very deep dramatic projects that have these moments of comedy or very comedic projects that have these moments of very severe drama. How do you deal with those moments that sort of step away from the overall, you know, emotional pace of the project? Uh, any, uh, any. Uh, well, I, I think mean, you, yeah. Though I think you had the right answer. It's it's all about finding the truth, you know, and 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 I think especially I can w with um with regards to Atlanta, it's a show that kind of rides the line between drama, comedy, and surrealism. And I think because life is kind of weird and funny and sad and usually all at once, we just sort of go for whatever feels realist and what the truth is. And I think it works itself out in that way. And that you know we don't think too much about tone as we're doing it. It's just it's it's thinking about. Does this feel real? Does this feel authentic? Great. So I'm going to jump to, um, there's been a couple questions from the live stream. Um, Emily asks, what would you say to an aspiring film editor in high school? Work. Try. Yeah. Do. Meet as many people as you can. You know, I mean, I don't know about other people, but I didn't know anybody in the film business. And... Um, but there was a calling, there was a thing, you know, you end up working for free. If you're in high school, uh, you can probably go, to whether or not it's to a university or to a television station or something like that, and be an intern. And it's always a process of just getting to know people and building a network. One of the things I do say to people, um, if you want to work in features, try to stay in features because those are the contacts that you're going to make. If you want to work in television, which is such an amazing you know, thing in today's world, you know, those are the people you're going to meet and those are the people who are going to refer you and recommend you and things like that. And same thing, documentaries. It's hard to cross over sometimes. I think it's much easier now than it was when I started. But um, it's like you don't need to know anybody. You just need to get out there and sort of put yourself out there and start meeting people. And that actually brings up a, an interesting topic that... Um, has been very prevalent of recent, you know, years is the democratization of, of filmmaking and tools for filmmaking. How do you think that that sort of changed the industry? Just that the, you know, the, the cameras, the editing platforms, the, the things that you need to make something are so accessible now. You can make a movie with a phone. So anybody can do it. Yeah, you, you don't need permission. Just do it. Don't you know? Don't wait around for someone to ask you to make a movie. Sure, sure, yeah. Just yeah, no. Just I mean, I've made stuff on you know on my phone. Like I'm not, but um, yeah, no. Just go out, get out in the street, and do it. And what do you think, Sophia? I agree with both things. And if I think if you're in high school, I mean, I don't know in high school, but I think especially in film school, if you don't want to be be a director and you want to be a cinematographer or an editor or someone that works for someone else or collaborates with someone else, I think the best thing to do is to be smart and look around and find the smartest guy in the class and work with him. <laughs> you know, no, serious, but I think it's like you need to like find who you want to work with and stick and make yourself indispensable for that person. And like probably that kid is like, if you go to NYU, the chances of one of your classmates becoming like a really cool director is like high. And I think you can spot them right away in the first thing they do in, like the first assignment they do in film school, you can like spot who's gonna go places and then work for them. Yeah, Kyle, you, I mean, you, your trajectory in your career has been interesting because you didn't follow the traditional path of going to film school. D do you find that that's, that's good advice from Sophia? Like connect with the people you feel like are talented and stick with them? Well, I mean, it makes me wish I had gone to film school. <laughs> you know, I, I just, uh, I'm, I've been very, very lucky with, I, I just made stuff because I wanted to get better at it. And, and through making more and more stuff, I just cast a wider net and, and the right people started seeing the right things and that led to jobs, which led to bigger and better jobs and better jobs and, and, and all the while getting better at it. So yeah, no, I, I mean, I, that, I mean, it sounds like great advice, but, it, but it's not what I did. In the, you went to film school, you made your own things and I just started in the trenches, you know, so it's each one of us has done it in an entirely different way. If you do go to film school, the best thing about film school is the contacts, the, the network that you create. Um, you're going to have it the rest of your life, but 
you can build that network in other ways. And each way is wonderful by itself. So again, to that woman in, you know, in girl in high school, um, I was an English major. I'm really happy I was an English major. I learned to become critical about storytelling through writing papers, and, um, and that really has stood me in very good stead. The other, the other thing um, that comes up in this conversation of sort of how accessible filmmaking is today is how more diverse voices are being able to be heard and be seen in projects. Why do you think that that's, that's important? Well, I mean, cause it <laughs> because we, we need to hear everyone's voice, right? We don't wanna, I, I, I think the same way that we can democratize making films, the same way we can democratize different voices, you know, getting out there and, and I mean, who wants to, who wants to see one point of view over and over from, you know, one person deciding what gets made and what doesn't, right? We should rage against the machine, you know? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> start, I'm trying to start a revolution in here. <laughs> it's not working at all. People uh, have stories to tell. You know, I mean, think about the amount of uh, content that's out there, and there's going to continue to, to be. So people have things to say. And it's great that I feel like more and more we're starting to listen to, to the things that people have to say that maybe haven't been listened to uh, in the past. Yeah, I, I'm a 40-year-old white guy. I shouldn't be answering this question at all. No, no, no. But I also think that the good thing about the democratization of, of the media platforms or social media, whatever, it's like, like there's no excuse anymore not to do things. So I feel like anyone that has a voice that wants to be heard and has the like drive to do it can do it and that's huge because you can be in the middle of nowhere or have the means or not have the means but if you have a good idea that might get you somewhere actually. Um, Kyle, uh, Jason from the live stream asks if you could speak a little bit about more about getting your union hours and as an assistant editor and what would you recommend that path? Yeah, I, I don't know. You, you might be better. At least it might be better to answer this question. I was president of the union for nine years and also I was, um, I came up, in, I got into the union when basically you, somebody had to have died or you know, you had to be married into it and I was part of the process where we opened up membership. Um, we have this thing where you need to get f 100 non-union, 100 days working as an assistant editor and then you can get into the union. Um, we're trying to change that process so that hopefully, maybe, so that if you work as a PA on a, um, on a movie or something like that, those things can go in. The, uh, the whole idea is that if you, if you work and you really wanna get in, you can get in. Uh, so from when I was started, it is so open. Um, going in and working in reality is a very fast way to do it because exactly. they right. always need assistance and you're gonna get your 100 days pretty quickly. Um, trying to get it on non-union films, you have to piece things together, but there's a will, there's a way and hopefully we are going to simplify the process even more, but it has come so far. It has come really far. So now we're gonna move to taking some questions from the audience here in the room. If you have a question, if you could just put your hand up. We have somebody coming around with a mic down here in the front. <coughs> Thank you. Hi, so um, I think you mentioned earlier the um, process of combining voices and bringing it all together into one cohesive story. How do you deal with the, con the obvious conflict that can arise in a room between director and editor in terms of making decision? And how do you deal with those times when you step back and say, okay, you're the director, this is your decision, and those times when you feel you want to step forward and say, no, I'm the editor, this is my decision now? <laughs> How do you deal with that back and well, forth? Yeah, I got, <laughs> I got bad news. <laughs> yeah, um, 
I, yeah, I think the, the best projects are ones that you collaborate and you have a director who's open to ideas and open to different voices and that. But I, I've never, have you ever encountered a director who said, okay, you're the editor? You. No, what you can do is you can say, and what I try to do is joke, I say, okay, I'll just close my eyes every time that cut goes by. You know, you, get, you have to make a joke about it at a certain point because there are sometimes I am definitely a little more on the old-fashioned side in terms of continuity. If something is really off, I think that it really throws the audience sometimes. You know, it's like, I think you can get away with a lot, but I think there are things sometimes that you can't get away with, and then it becomes an art of negotiation. You know, it's like you have to become very um, cogent and coherent about why you believe something should be a certain way. Um, and ultimately it is their project and you want them to be happy. That is the thing. Bottom line is it's, um, it's got to be something that is right for them, but you can say, I don't agree, you know, it's like, and it's the way in which you say it. Yeah, and I think also probably the scenes where you don't agree are the ones that you're going to work harder to like make your point or you're going to work harder to get to compromise and find a middle ground where everyone's happy and I feel like also you become this kind of like like I don't know like I feel like you I have different approach with different editors of how to like like it might sound a little manipulative but I guess it is which is like I know like which some directors you say things a certain way with that you know what I mean like you you feel it out because you end up spending so much time that you really get to know each other and you n understand how you like I don't know, it's it's like a give and take thing. Presenting things in a very specific order, I find is like a, a really a, a, a way to fake people out, <laughs> right? Um, another question from the live stream, Freddie asks, how long did it take each of you to get comfortable and work easily with Premiere Pro? Not a plant, I promise. <laughs> I went from Final Cut 7 to Premiere Pro, so the transition was pretty easy. And I had to do it for a very specific, like, in-between movies job that I was doing this uh, web series, and I had to jump in for one episode, and it was a thing that I couldn't just do it. Like, I had to do it in Premiere. And it was so seamless and easy, and I literally just put, like, I configured the keyboard to Final Cut and then everything was the same but much better and this as easy. So uh, I was about to start a movie and then we just, at the last minute I was like, let's do this, do this in Premiere and it worked out great. For, m for me that I'm really bad with technology was like a lifesaver because I could see Final Cut Pro like sinking and like there was like nothing to do about it. They were, they were not doing, like they did Final Cut X and that was, you couldn't get a movie on that. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to learn Avid now. And then Premiere came out, like that happened, and I was, oh, I can actually edit movies in this, and it works. And then you actually, for Tyrell, somebody tried to convince you not to use Promo Premiere Pro, and you were pretty, <laughs> pretty insistent, yes? No, because I was finishing piercing when they started uh, doing Tyrell, so my friend Jen Lame, which is an editor, she edited Manchester by the Sea, she came in and started with Seb while I was finishing with Tyrell, and she's used to edit, uh, editing in Avid, and I knew that eventually, like we cut together for like a month or two, and then she was gonna leave, and I'm gonna have, uh, and I had like three more months to go. So I was like, you can't leave me by myself <laughs> with this project in Avid, so forget it, you're learning <laughs> from here. Um, so it worked out, it was easy, yeah. It and she easy learned work. fairly quickly? She did, yeah, she did. Uh, uh, we had to like come up with a setup so it was easier for her when I wasn't there, but but it was pretty it was pretty simple, yeah. That's great. How about you, Carl? Yeah. I you know I um it's pretty quick. I in between seasons of Atlanta, I cut a show on Avid, and there's always going to that show and then coming back to Atlanta. There was there's always a, maybe a week where I just feel like I don't know what I'm doing and like my brain and my hands aren't working in sync. But it's it's pretty quick after that. My brain, I think, is now wired into Premiere because I did a um, something at the Union uh, that was on Avid, and I totally forgot what to do. And I started cutting on Avid in 1995, you know, so it's a long time ago. But you're, you know, it's once your brain gets wired, it gets wired. I'm assuming I'll cut another show on Avid, and it'll be that. I'd love to continue to working in Premiere because, my, you know, it's like 
the momentum and going. I want to get better at titles. I want to get better at effects. There are lots of things that I want to continue to learn. And that was one of the things that was really exciting for me was learning something new and the fact that I was able to do it. Yeah, and you mentioned that um, you had some training at the beginning before you started in on The Old Man and the Gun. How long did you and Christine Steele work together? Uh, I had the most wonderful situation because I live in Topanga and Christine lives in Woodland Hills and so I was literally 14 minutes away from her. So it was, and she was willing to cut it up in segments because I find that when I'm learning something new like this, my brain can only do it for two, three hours at a time because, uh, you know, really focused and concentrated. Um, so we spread it out actually over a number of months. Um, and so then by the time I started, uh, I was fine. You know, I mean, obviously I was calling Mike all the time. What did I do? I didn't... Um, Mike, your assistant. Editor, Mike, yeah. my assistant. Uh, there was one thing I kept doing all the time. I can't remember it now. And it was just, that was really... Well, annoying. the muscle memory <laughs> after that many years in a well, single program, did, I'm sure. Yes, but the thing that I did is I did something different than I think a lot of people do um, because Christine is so such a good teacher and she's done she's taught so many different kinds of people i didn't just change my keyboard to avid because there's things about the avid keyboard that are a pain in the ass and also because i have programmed my keyboard so i did something i've just started oh, wow. uh, you know i just made my own keyboard again and i got a WASD gaming keyboard because i learned on the i like the high profile keyboards so i have all these things color coded and you know it's really it's really fun <laughs> any other questions uh in the audience here in the back in the hat uh hi uh just wanted to say uh i love the warriors one of my favorites <laughs> Me too. really <laughs> I love Man Seeking Woman, and I love Atlanta. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I have yet to see any of your movies, uh, but I definitely plan to. But um, could, could you speak a little bit closer to the oh, mic? Oh, right. Sorry. Um, so my question's for Kyle. Um, you said you worked on uh, Man Seeking Woman and, and Atlanta. Uh, I feel like there's like a sort of like similar tone in like how they tell the story in terms of you saying like, uh, it's sort of like real life because it's like happy, sad, funny, all of it at once. Do you think there was like a big difference in working on both of those shows? No, I think you're right. I've actually never, yeah, no, you're right. They are similar in that they sort of combine genres a lot. Um, they're sort of made very differently, you know, but they're both through, well, you know what, even that's not true. They're, they're, Man Taking Woman was very much Simon's vision and, and Atlanta is very much Donald. So no, I think it's just, um, I don't think it's a coincidence that they're on the same network. You know, I think that's the sort of stuff that those those guys sort of see the the magic in it. But yeah, no, I, it, the it's a pretty similar process. We cut them both on premiere too. You know, which just makes it even even more alike. Better. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Easy, <laughs> easier. Yeah, sure. Um, any uh, over here uh, on the outside over here, Margot. Um, I'm just wondering if any of you have ever wanted to direct and what you think being an editor, having experience as an editor can bring to being a good director. Um, I think at a certain point when I started, I thought that that's exactly what I was going to do. And then the more I did editing, I realized that um, I... I don't, I'm not driven to say something in my own unique way. I'm driven to help other people say it. And I have a very strong opinion about that. I mean, I believe that people hire us for our opinions. But I, in terms of formulating the idea and creating the idea, I realized at a certain point, but I think when I started, I assumed that I was going to do that or produce or something. But um, at a certain point, it's... Uh, and, for a director, it's a fabulous 
way to to go up because first of all as you're shooting you know at certain points i know with david when you know certain times shooting and he ran out of time it's like i'm not going to need that you know and you get to make choices or sometimes going to the video feed and cutting something together right there on the set so that he knew whether or not he had it so it's um and i have friends who have be, been editors and become directors and it's a great great training ground yeah, no, I, uh, I I learned to edit because I wanted to direct and I didn't want to rely on an editor to find someone. So I, but uh, the more I did it, the more I realized that I, I think I preferred it and I and I really loved doing it. And and yeah, like Lisa was saying, it's you can really tell a difference working with directors who know how to edit and those who don't. There's a, it's a, there's a real difference. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. And to me, I went from like direct, I, in, in film school I always directed and I was like, it looked like I was going to direct. And then I went into producing just because I wanted to try something different before. And then editing, editing happened by accident. And I was like, oh, this is exactly where I want to fall. And I think it had to do with um, I don't like being in set. I really don't. I hate dealing with actors. I don't have Two the patience. Two clues that maybe yeah. directing this, this is the true. This is the real answer. <laughs> and I don't have the patience to develop a project from start. I think it's crazy. It takes years. And when you're editing, you have so much creative control and you're really like, you do feel like you're collaborating with the director in such a creative way that you, I kind of like get my like, like hunger for creative directing is completely fulfilled and then I'm in the like piece of my editing suite and I don't have to deal with anyone else and it's so much better than being on set. I think to be a director you really have to be driven in a certain kind of way. You ha you know, you can't not do it. Um, yeah. And if you don't feel that way, then there are so many other ways that you can contribute and collaborate. And I feel like each and every one of the films that I've worked on is my baby. Oh, it's, uh, I feel passionate about each and every one of them. Okay, we're gonna take one final question uh, in the back there. Hi, thank you for coming. I appreciate um, being here. Uh, my, qu my question is, um, I started on Final Cut. I still edit on Final Cut, sorry about that. But um, from five I'm to seven. I'm watching you, I am <laughs> watching you. <laughs> from five to seven, and then I waited forever to, before I got to X, because you know, it was totally different. But um, my question for you though is, I only edit my own projects and projects that I shoot for my clients. How important it is if I wanna get to, you know, to what you guys are doing, where there's more money yet, um, should I learn Premiere or Avid in conjunction with what I already know to make myself more, you know, um, attainable? I think yes. I think the more you know, the easier, I mean, there's certain jobs that I've had to pass because I didn't work on Avid at the time, or like, and this, the, the work that made me learn Premiere, I was gonna pass, and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna do it, because I, I can't keep on passing on jobs, because I only edited in Final Cut 7, which is also not gonna be around for long. So I just did it, and then it happened that I, that Premiere, I, I, I was able to ke keep on cutting in Premiere, and it wasn't a problem, but if, I wanted a movie now, and that movie was had to happen in Avid, no matter what. Then I'll say I would say that I know how to do it, and then I would learn it overnight and deal with it. I think you, yeah, don't let yeah. by any means like not knowing a program stop you from getting a job. Right. The the thing is, is that it doesn't really matter what it is that you're doing. I you know I think that Avid is. Uh, a lot of television is moving to Premiere, um, I think, uh, because of the cost of the systems and younger people who came up from uh, learning Final Cut and going to Premiere. Um, but it's if somebody asks you to do something on Avid, learn it. It's uh, I agree. Don't you can't you can't know too much, right? You can't you can't know too right. much. Right. Being an editor has very little to do with the program. So, and, or being technically savvy, I think. Like, 
like the first movie I edited, I edited with a YouTube tutorials like of how to fade. I had no idea what I was doing, <laughs> and it did, and it doesn't matter. Like it really doesn't matter. And I, there's still things that I don't know how to do, and I ask the assistant to do. And like n being savvy with pr pr projects makes your life easier, but it won't get you a job or it won't make you a better editor. I think. Yeah, I actually remember asking you, Sophia, why you choose Premiere, and you're like, well, kind of because I don't notice that it is Premiere anymore. It's just what I'm working in, and I'm able to think about the story more than and, and the buttons. Yeah, and, and I feel like now it's, it's bec like, I feel like the first time I, we had a movie in Premiere, we had to, like, like, I don't know, I think it was Christine. We had to, like, tell the producers, like, yeah, we want to do it in Premiere, and this is why. And now, this was only three years ago, and I think now it stopped being a thing. Like, like if you say Premiere, no one's going to, like, try to to make you cut anything else. So it's become oh. like an industry standard in a good way. Mm -hmm. The Cohen brothers work on Premiere. It's true, so does David Fincher. Um, and if, you've, if you cut uh, on Final Cut 7, the transition to Premiere is, is quite, quite straightforward, yeah. Oh, but I thought you said you would move from 7 to X. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you're learning X is learning a new program anyway, right? So you, yeah, you, you learn one that people use. Okay. That, was, that sounds like a diss. <laughs> I guess, all right, well, this is the forum for it, I guess, right? <laughs> well, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have today. I want to thank our panelists so much for being here. <laughs> thank you here in the room, and thanks to the live stream audience for joining, and enjoy the rest of Sundance. If you want to see more of what Adobe's doing at Sundance, you can tune in to the uh, Premiere Pro Facebook page. We're doing daily live stream Q&As with all sorts of amazing, talented filmmakers here at the festival. Thanks again, guys. <laughs>